Item number four, the next item is an update on the position of the coronavirus COVID-19. Can I ask officers, chief officers, to address the council meeting, please? Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you to members for giving time to this important issue tonight. But also thanks to all members for being really careful about their own health and um, helping us do a council meeting this evening to see some business through, but in a manner that keeps as many people safe as possible. Um, I think you, you all know me, I'm Paul Hanson, the Chief Executive. Um, what we plan to cover in, in this session is I'm going to talk briefly a little around local, uh, regional and national planning. I'll cover a little bit about our strategic objectives as a local authority as we respond to this issue. Then Wendy Burke, your Director of Public Health, will talk you through the public health aspects and science of what's happening right now and the national health response to that. Phil Scott, who is the Chief Officer responsible for Emergency Preparedness and Resilience, will talk through our response and what we've been doing. Um, and then Bryn Roberts, your uh, Monitoring Officer, will take you through a couple of things that are issues for members, both as a council and as individuals. And then we'll try and take any questions if uh, members have those. Um, I think in, in opening, there's a couple of things that I'd want to say that I've been saying to um, all of my team over the last couple of weeks. Um, North Tyneside Council is really good at responding to things. Our members and officers get stuck in. Um, you, know, it, you know, if there's something gone wrong, we try and put it right. Um, a number of members in the room have seen us uh, collectively in action when maybe flooding or bad weather has affected our residents. And, and, and we've got lots of people who are great at pulling on a high-vis jacket, getting stuck in, trying to help people out. And a couple of days later, um, you know, the sun comes out and we, can, and we get back to normal. I think the thing that we're all facing right now is singularly different from all of that in terms of our own personal experiences of a global pandemic and something we've none of us really experienced before. And as an organization, this is very different. It will take some time. It will require a great deal of emotional and physical resilience from all of us. Um, and we're gonna to have to plan and handle this carefully so that we look after the team, so the team can look after the borough. Um, but um, we, we have a good gang. You will know if you were here, Councillor Glyndon would draw your attention to the uh, corporate risk register and the fact that pandemic flu has been an understood risk. The planet has been running for quite some time um, and it was always a question of, of when rather than if. Um, and I hope that by the time we finished, you've got a sense of how we're approaching this and how we will work with members, um, organisations in the borough um, and the residents and businesses of the borough to do our very best through a tricky few months. I have to say my personal optimism, which is usually quite resilient, has been buoyed by the response of the community, the response of our organisations, and how my team have responded to this, and the degree to which um, the, 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 the officers of North Tyneside, the members of North Tyneside Council, want to make a difference for their communities. So that's been enormously cheering during a, a quite difficult period, um, and presumably a series of difficult weeks and months to come. If I might just talk about um, the, the, the local, regional and national arrangements around this. Um, it, it's a bit timely, um, but some members were at members briefing a few weeks ago that we covered our emergency planning arrangements and how we do this. So some of you are very familiar with how this works. Um, in terms of the local arrangements, we have exercised and planned emergency response. Um, Phil chairs an emergency response resilience leadership group. We have plans, documents, people who are trained. A number of us are trained in multi agency called Incident Command. Uh, we're trained in how to respond and we're trained in how the national approach to this and the national statute to the incidents um, applies. So we've used our emergency planning structures around that. The people who are, are, are the right folk with the right skills are together on a regular basis planning our response and Phil will give you a sense of how that actually works. Regionally, the, the England works on local resilience forum, or fora, depending on how you want to think about that one. Uh, they are at police force level, so we are part of the Northumbria local resilience forum and each of those local resilience forums are required to hold a risk register and think about what might happen in those areas 
that reflects national and local risks. You'd be wholly unsurprised to know that pandemic flu is on that register, but for the North East and Northumbria area in particular, it considers things like the approach to Newcastle Airport, the East Coast Mainline. So on a routine basis, a range of partners who are described as Category 1 responders in the legislation, that's the Blue Light Services and local authorities, get together and plan for and exercise these kinds of incidents. But in addition to that, um, there are uh, a set of um, chief executives for each of our 12 local authorities working on a regular basis and making sure we compare notes. So it was weekly, it's currently daily, but we are just making sure, has anybody got the same issue? Are we all worrying about the same things? Are we um, paying attention to guidance? So that helps us keep in touch with each other and make sure we're staying in step and each other thinking about what we might have missed or if we're all worrying about the same things, that's probably right. That group of 12 in the northeast, represented by Martin Swales, come together as about nine different regions. You remember that England broadly divides up into nine regions um, that have been used for different purposes over a number of years. Each of those local authority regions has a chief executive who's talking directly to um, the Secretary of State for Community, Housing, Communities and Local Government and the wider ministerial team working on this. And that's allowing local government to put um, views and issues direct to government and get a sense of um, national policy direction. And we're trying to coordinate that with the Prime Minister and ministerial team's daily briefings and the planning purpose stuff that happens at a national level through Cabinet Office Brief and Remain and the, the point at which the national resilience structure comes together with the political executive structure. So there's work happens in North Tyneside Council and in North Tyneside, there's work happening at a regional level, um, which for our purposes is both the local resilience forum, six local authority areas for Northumbria Police Force, and then the 12 local authorities are trying to make sure they stay in step and they pay attention and learn from each other, we point to a, a set of national arrangements. I thought the, the last thing I would do before <laughs> handing you over to Wendy to talk about the, the um, actual virus and how that works, there is an approach to um, emergency planning that says the first thing you do is agree your strategic objectives. In short term, very quick incidents, it can be really, really um, effective to make sure you're clear on what you're trying to achieve. And the national approach to this around joint decision making put almost forces those responders to set some objectives first because the psychology of making decisions under pressure means that often people are responding to adrenaline, to kind of, you know, the, 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 the urgency of the situation and might not think clearly. So one of the things that is required of us is to set a set of objectives for what our work and what we're trying to do. We'll review these on a regular basis, but for the moment, I thought I'd just want to explain how we're coming at this. The first and most important thing we thought we needed to do is show calm and resilient leadership. Across the member and officer team in North Tyneside Council, this is a really uncertain period for our residents and our businesses. And the first thing we need to do is, is, is think about how we stay calm and resilient. The second thing we will absolutely do as a team is stick with national guidance. Now that might seem screamingly obvious, but actually, as you've watched some of the debates play out, particularly the pressure our head teachers have been under in the last few days, that's not as easy as it sounds, um, where particular issues are subject to debate, or perhaps the science hasn't settled and how people feel about it. But I'm sure you, as a, 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 as a, as a set of elected members, would want me to pay attention to what is Parliament and the Executive asking us to do, what is the national position on this. The third thing we're really clear we needed to do in what is a very fast moving and quite dynamic situation is reflect the current context. So, you know, a few days ago, a week or so ago, Wendy, Phil and I and the rest of the team were thinking very much about containment, identifying individual cases, helping Public Health England with contact tracing and making sure we were thinking about how we support individuals or specific locations and businesses that were affected and contained um, infection. 
the move to a delay phase means we have to change our attitude to this. So we were really clear that as well as following national guidance, we have to be understanding of the current context and what is both government and our team trying to achieve. Right now, that's about slowing the speed of infection and flattening a curve. And Wendy and Phil will talk a bit more about what that means for us and how it affects our residents and our businesses and our team. The three that you would expect to be there, if we were putting some objectives together and you had to guess what they were, are we have to protect vulnerable people in North Tyneside. That definition of vulnerability is still moving as the science evolves, as we understand the condition. You will know the national guidance talks about over 70s, but over 70s with underlying medical conditions are particularly vulnerable. We know some families rely on particular businesses that are in a difficult time at the moment. We know some people are seeing their lives disrupted by um, some of the decisions that are going to be taken around potential school closures. So our objective is to protect vulnerable. The objective of also is, of course, to protect our own staff. We've had to look hard at our own workforce, who's at risk, who are doing particular jobs that will come with risk, and how do we look after the team so they can look after the borough. And then finally, what we've been putting our minds to is thinking about how we look after all of North Tyneside. This is a set of really unusual circumstances. And while we will focus on the vulnerable, we also have to think about how the whole of the borough is doing, how its mental and physical health will change over the next few months and what we can do around all of that. But our focus has to be on what are our essential services that we need to keep running through a period where we know it's highly likely a significant number of our team will not be at work and a significant number of our residents will be unwell. So we are focused on those essential services, but we're also focused on working in partnership with our businesses, with the community and voluntary sector and our other partners in terms of looking after the whole borough. So those things govern what we decide to do as an authority. We'll refresh those, we'll have a look at them, we'll keep coming back with them as the situation changes, but when we make decisions, we are deliberately giving ourselves a set of objectives to, to, to inform those decisions. That kind of governance structure that I talked about earlier, where Phil and Wendy co-chair our emergency response committee, is increasingly backed up by a further group of officer team right now who are thinking about recovery. Good practice in emergency planning says the moment the event occurs, you start thinking about what comes later. Right now, there are a number of events, a number of measures being taken by government in the budget and the further announcements from the Chancellor, which are about supporting business. But we also need to think about what will the economy be like um, at the end of this? What do we do with business in North Tyneside? What do we do for North Tyneside as a borough? And how will our communities feel? So a separate set of the team are thinking now about what does recovery look like as we get towards the end of this? So I'm going to stop. That's, where, that's how we're organised and what we're thinking about. Wendy will take you through the public health aspects of this and Phil will talk through the, um, the response. Bryn has a couple of things to say about members and then we'll try and take any questions you might have. Okay, thanks Wendy. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to come and tell you a bit more about uh, coronavirus disease 19. So, Council will be aware that on the 11th of March, um, a global pandemic was announced by the World Health Organization. The figures that were published by the WHO as of the 18th of March, which was yesterday, identifies that just over 190,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 um, across the world with um, 8,000 deaths um, across 159 countries. In relation to the global pandemic, um, when it was announced, the UK government the very next day raised the risk level in the UK from moderate to high. And as of yesterday, um, just over 56,000 people have been tested for the disease with 2,626 confirmed cases, although this is thought to be a gross underestimate, with figures more likely to be in the tens of thousands. To date, there have been 103 deaths in the UK, and the numbers across the North East and North Tyneside are reported to be relatively small, 
but community testing um, ceased on the 12th of March and only people admitted to hospital are currently being tested. So again, those figures are likely to be an underestimate of both the position in North Tyneside and the North East. So what is COVID-19? The virus responsible is referred to as SARS coronavirus 2. That's, sorry, that's, um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus 2. Um, the virus causes the disease, which is referred to as Coronavirus Disease 19. 19 stands for the year that it was discovered. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses, and some cause less severe diseases, such as the common cold, whereas others cause more severe diseases, such as SARS. And actually, the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus is genetically related to the virus that caused the SARS epidemic in 2003. The problem with the virus is that it's a new virus, um, it causes respiratory illness, and because of that, because of the fact that it's new, it means that there's no immunity in the population, um, and that means there's extensive potential for it to spread. So how, how is the virus spread? Well, there's a lot that we don't know about the virus. However, if we look at other coronaviruses, they're mainly transmitted by respiratory droplet um, transmission, either directly or indirectly, uh, and that, that is contact with infected secretions. Droplets can be directly transferred into the mouths or the noses of people who are nearby. Um, within about two meters, um, a cough and a sneeze can reach up to about a maximum of, of six foot or two meters. And while viruses are not living things because they're parasitic in nature and they require a host in which to replicate, which is their, their prime reason for being, they can be transferred to other surfaces. But it's unclear about how much virus is left on surfaces over time. And that's very much dependent on things like exposure to sunlight, temperature, humidity, and under most circumstances we know that um, any amount of virus on any contaminated surface is likely to have decreased quite, signif quite sig significantly um, by 72 hours. So this means that the virus can be transferred to and by people's hands, and then if people touch their face, their nose, their mouth, their eyes, with unwashed hands, the infection can spread because it's absorbed via those very fine mucous membranes in the eyes, the nose and the mouth. And that's the reason why regular hand hygiene is absolutely critical in this pandemic. So this slide just demonstrates the number, the, the average number of people that one person with the virus um, can infect and it kind of compares it to other infections, so it com compares it to H1N1, which was responsible for the swine flu epidemic, and also for the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, and also Ebola. And you can see <laughs> that it is more infectious than both um, of those two. However, to put that into some kind of context, if you think about measles, um, the RO rate for measles is between 11 and 18. So actually, it's nowhere near as infectious as, as measles. So who's, at, who's most at risk? Well, anyone can acquire the infection because of the lack of immunity at population level. <laughs> but this virus has a predilection for adults of, mid, uh, adults of middle age and also older people. And we know that older people older age is associated with increased mortality. Symptomatic infection in children from the studies that have been done and from what we know from um, China and Italy is largely uncommon. And in one Chinese study, only 2% of infections were confirmed in individuals under the age of 20. So what are the symptoms? Well, the maximum time taken from being infected to symptoms appearing um, is thought to be 14 days, but we know that from what's gone before, again, predominantly in Italy, uh, Iran, South Korea, and China, that most symptoms seem to develop between four to five days after exposure to the infection. 
The main symptoms are a fever and a dry, persistent cough. And we know that a, from a study um, that was conducted in China, that around 99% of people had fever, 70% of people had fatigue, and about 60% had a dry cough. But there are other symptoms. Most cases, most cases appear to be mild, and there are asymptomatic infections that have been reported. Pneumonia appears to be the most frequent serious complication, and we know that more serious and severe symptoms are found in older people and those with underlying health problems. And it would appear that most symptoms appear to resolve within a seven-day period, particularly if those symptoms are mild. So what to do if someone has symptoms? So this is the current UK government advice on what to do if someone has symptoms. So if someone's been symptomatic or is symptomatic, they must stay at home for seven days um, and they can end the self-isolation after seven days if they no longer have a high temperature. We are recommending using paracetamol for high temperature and not ibuprofen. There appears to be some emerging evidence that suggests that ibuprofen dampens the natural inflammatory response to the virus, which is actually really important in terms of developing that immune response and also for recovery. If living with others, then all household members must also stay at home, but that period is for 14 days. And again, that is related to the maximum incubation period. People who remain well after the 14 days incubation period um, and, and household isolation are unlikely to be infectious um, and those who remain well after that period can then go about their day-to-day -day business. If any other family member becomes unwell during the 14-day household isolation period, then they should follow the same advice and again it's seven days um, to stay at home and after the symptoms settle, after those seven days, if they feel better and they no longer have a high temperature, then they can also return to the normal routine. We, we know um, that the cough often persists beyond the seven days and that would be no reason to stay at home, providing there's no high temperature. The isolation period doesn't need to be extended for the rest of the household if somebody in that household develops new symptoms. Um, you just do your 14 days maximum. Um, and the person with new symptoms uh, stays at home for seven days. So this is the government stay at home um, advice. These are the main bullet points. And as you can say, see, it, it's advice around staying away from people, uh, keeping that two meter distance, um, sleeping alone where possible, washing hands regularly, and particularly keeping away from vulnerable individuals either not being in the same house as them or, at, where possible, um, being in separate rooms. Also, important points about planning ahead and particularly asking other people for help. So what, what's, the current, what's the current strategy from the UK government? So we've received some planning assumptions. These are modelled estimates that have been developed for each local resilience forum from the chief government scientific advisor and also from the scientific advisory group for emergencies, um, which advises COBRA. Um, and what we know um, from previous um, infections in other countries is that it, there appears to be an 80%, or the worst case scenario would be an 80% infection attack rate. So that means 80% of our population um, getting the infection. However, of that 80%, 50% of, of people will have clinical symptoms and the vast majority of those will be mild. Of that 50%, 30% will have symptoms that will require some sort of assessment by a health professional. And 4% of that 50% will have symptoms that will require them to have hospital care. 1% of the 50% will require uh, critical care. And then we've got an estimated infection fatality rate of about 1%. But that varies across the age range. The, the model estimates suggest from 0.01% in children under the age of 9, rising to 8.76% in people aged over 80. But I think even then you have to consider an 8.7% um, infection 
fatality rate means that even if you're 80 and over, um, a vast proportion of uh, people will still survive, which is good news. It's estimated that the peak of the epidemic curve will be achieved by about 11 weeks um, from the first infection and with the epidemic uh, lasting up to about 22 weeks in the first instance. So that's the modelled estimate data. So in terms of the government response, the evidence tells us that we need to combine multiple, multiple interventions to substanti substantially impact on transmission. Um, and there's two key approaches. The first one is about mitigation. And what mitigation is, is, is about flattening the curve. So that's about slowing the spread of the disease, reducing the peak of the healthcare demand, and protecting those most at risk. And that's why we've got those policies of isolating suspected cases, household quarantine, and social distancing, particularly for vulnerable people. Um, it's estimated that doing those, putting those measures in place might reduce the peak in the healthcare demand by about two thirds and reducing deaths by about half. But on its own, those, those mitigation measures will still not prevent hundreds of thousands of deaths. So actually we need something else. And that's where suppression comes in. So this is reducing the epidemic growth and reducing the number of cases to low levels through social distancing measures across the entirety of the population. And this is the reason for the guidance for us all to be practicing social distancing and the reason that our schools are closing tomorrow. Uh, the problem with suppression is that you need, to, you need to maintain that for a long period of time because the minute that you lift your foot off the pedal you will see a resurgence of, tra of transmission and infection rates, and that, that's the main problem. What we probably will need to do is to maintain these approaches until a vaccine becomes available, and that's not likely to be for about another year to 18 months. So they're the approaches. And I, sorry, I'll just go back to that one. You can see on that slide, you can see the power of social distancing. You can see the impact, and it's, it's quite stark in terms of the impact moving from a potential to have 406 people infected within a 30-day period with 70, 75% less exposure um, with social distancing measures, reducing that to 2.5 people in 30 days is quite remarkable. So the current advice on social distancing as well as advice for the totality of the population that we should all be practicing it. The specific advice for over 70s, those with underlying health conditions, pregnant women, and those with very serious complex um, health problems. And the underlying health conditions for the under 70s are largely the eligibility criteria for a flu vaccination. This is the summary of the current advice on social distancing. It's a really good summary. Um, and again, it, it tells us all what we should be doing right across the population if we're under 70 um, and gives advice on the other categories as well. And that, that's worth just having at your fingertips as a reminder, I think. I think as in addition to that advice on social distancing across the population and particularly for our vulnerable um, people, um, there's clearly a lot more action that we can all take and that involves you know, reducing our contact with people who are sick, covering um, our face for coughing and sneezing and disposing of tissues, um, avoid touching, uh, avoid hands touching the nose, eyes and mouth, cleaning areas that are touched frequently um, both in the household uh, as well as other environments, staying at home when you're sick but most importantly, last but not least, washing your hands often with hot water and soap and where you haven't got access to hot water and soap, um, using hand sanitizer as a pretty good alternative. Thank you all very much. I'm going to hand over to Phil now. <coughs> thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Chair. Can I thank everyone um, this evening for the opportunity to come along and um, um, highlight our um, emergency planning and preparedness for this. 
For those who don't know me, I'm Phil Scott, I'm the Head of Environment, Housing and Leisure, and I'm the Senior um, Officer with Lead Responsibility for Resilience Management within the organisation. Um, we have, as Paul mentioned, uh, we do have a, a regular emergency response leadership group who meets and plans for this kind of thing. Uh, it became um, really evident early um, uh, in the national um, 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 scenario that actually would have to establish something specifically for this particular risk. So whilst we plan for pandemic flu, and it's one that's always been on our risk register, actually we wanted to kind of look specifically at this particular risk. Um, we agreed to meet with some key individuals from service areas and trade unions um, on a weekly basis and it became um, um, strongly evident very soon that actually we were going to have to look at some kind of strategic coordinating group that's going to have to meet on a daily basis. That meets on a daily basis, myself co-chaired with Wendy with some, uh, some key senior officers in the organisation um, and it, rough, I think the shortest meeting so far has been about half a day as this is a very dynamic and kind of changing situation. Paul mentioned we have our strategic objectives. Um, we test all of our decisions against those strategic objectives. Um, following national guidance is really, really important. I can't emphasise how much, how immensely comforting it is to have the, the Director of Public Health as part of that group, because actually we have a direct link into national guidance. So the, so the scientists who are advising the Prime Minister are also kind of getting, uh, we're getting direct link into their advice. And a national approach to this that Wendy's talking about only works if we adopt it on a local level. Everybody has to follow the national guidance for it to be effective. So it's very important that we do that. I won't run through the objectives, Paul's talked about them, but I know we are circulating the, um, the, the presentation. So, what does that mean for the council? It's going to be a challenging year. We have actually got some planning assumptions based on the modelling done to date that Wendy talked about earlier. We have taken the national, we actually have a specific uh, model for. Uh, our employees, our workforce. We are expecting around about 20% of the workforce to be unavailable during the peak of the, um, of the curve that we'll talk about. About half of the workforce will have to have some time off during this, uh, during, uh, this um, period um, for an average number of days of about 14. So you start to get a feel for that's going to have some impact on council services over the coming months. That's exactly how the absence actually looks like it's going to pan out over the period of, um, of, the, of, of, of this period. Um, you will see there it's on a gradual kind of curve. It peaks and then comes down again. The first case we had was on Friday the 6th of March. So you can see from the numbers on the screens there, so number one is about the 6th of March. Going across, that means we're peaking at the back end of May and early June, and it kind of goes through until August. This is not an exact science at this point in time, and the modelling is very much based on the actions that we're taking um, following national guidance as well. This modelling was done before we closed schools. Um, if, if the country goes into lockdown, the model will have to be redone again. And there's some thinking right now that actually it might peak again later in the year as actually we kind of come out of the, um, the, 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 the peak periods and people start to kind of relax uh, the national guidance, we open up borders again, and there might be another peak on some of the population that kind of escaped it first time round. So it's at this point in time, this is the kind of like assumptions we're making and this is what we're planning against. With that in mind, every service in the council has a business continuity plan. We all identify a number of, kind of business critical activities that we think are really important to maintain. We have decided that we are actually going to have to take a look and reprioritize some of that as some of those business critical activities that service areas think are really important in the scheme of things. Actually, we may have to think differently. We have decided, we have agreed what the priority services that we must protect uh, during this period. So obviously, as you would expect, supporting the vulnerable is really, really important. We have a lot of services providing direct support to a lot of vulnerable um, people in our community. 
public health and hygiene is extremely important. So things like emptying the bins and make sure waste is not on our streets is really, really important because we want to take the, the, uh, the, um, the infection away. We want, we, we want waste piling up on our streets. Revenues, benefits and payments of regular and new support. We think it is an absolutely very important to ensure that where we are processing payments that offer financial support to people during this period or maintain at all costs throughout this period. And the reason why we're seeing new support is that we are anticipating during this period there will be that, those, that, that vulnerable group will change. We are expecting some kind of job losses, some people to be unemployed, all kinds of things that we're going to have to, it's not just a fixed position, we'll have to map kind of like our, our, our vulnerable clients as we kind of progress through the, um, through the months. Dignified and respectful bereavement services. There is an expectation that there will be quite a demand on those particular services and actually our role as local government is we will have a role to play in ensuring that we are um, um, dealing with um, the consequences of the virus. And absolutely in terms of communication and local leadership, there is a lot of misinformation out there. You've got the facts from the Director of Public Health and actually helping folk through directing people to kind of where they can get support if they need it and providing kind of good robust information is also a priority during the period. If you take into consideration the government advice, and obviously we are following national guidance, it's one of our strategic objectives, yeah, everybody is being asked to, kind of, to socially distance. We cannot encourage kind of, the community to, to gather now. That's just the wrong advice. In fact, we have to actively discourage it. Because of that, we've already made some decisions about closure or closure of some of our services. You will have seen that to date, we've already closed all of our branch libraries. We haven't closed our customer first centres. So we have four customer first centres, uh, one in Whitley Bay, <coughs> one in North Shields, um, uh, the White Swan Centre and Walls End. And we have also kept open um, the John Willie Sams um, Centre in the northwest of the borough and the Oxford Centre. This is because these uh, are shared buildings and there is access into essential services there. So some of them have doctor surgeries, some of them have police stations. Um, we were uh, absolutely, we won't be holding community gatherings or meetings there, but we are keeping those buildings open for now. Government is also asking us to think about some community hub provision where actually we've got a point in the community where we might be able to offer support, where we can kind of um, um, communicate and distribute whatever we need to. So actually we're probably thinking that it's not the right decision to close those facilities and act they could be used for that kind of thing moving forward. You will have also have seen we've now closed all of our leisure centres. Um, we've closed um, all of our um, um, the, um, the, uh, uh, centres where actually you were encouraging people to come and gather. Uh, again, we were the second in the region behind Darling to do that. I think most local authorities will make uh, an announcement by the end of this week and I believe there will, might be a national statement on actually all leisure centres kind of closing in the country. It is just, we have to discourage people from kind of like socially interacting. If, if the national strategy is to kind of succeed. Also, we've had to cancel or postpone all of the events that we have um, uh, had arranged. So things like the North Tyneside 10K road race, we've po po postponed that. We're trying to reschedule a date later in the year. Obviously, that would be subject to change if, if need be, but you can kind of get a feel for the list there. All of the events that were planned Obviously, following national guidance, we cannot continue with. At this point in time, the only announcement we haven't made is the Mouth of the Town Festival. We just, it's in July, um, we're just looking at, is there a possibility that, we'll kind of, that, that we might save that? Um, we'll just have to wait and see, expect an announcement on that. We'll have to make a kind of definitive position in the next week or two. At this point in time, we haven't can, uh, cancelled that. Now we have a profile, we have a profile of uh, the workforce, we are obviously <coughs> testing all of our business continuity plans against those, that profile. 
That means actually there's a gradual kind of review of all of the services we provide. It's going to be a tough year. Some of the services now we're having to make, obviously because of the, the, um, because of the national guidance, some of the face-to-face -face meetings, we're going to have to think differently about that. And we're having to start to think about what services drop off as actually the capacity to deliver them can recede. So everybody in every service area is testing their business continuity plans right now. So you might get a feel for it. It feels a bit different in the council. They're not being quite as responsive and they're not doing the things that way. We are having to make daily decisions against what can we do today and what can we not do today. Obviously, when we get into the peak period, we'll be stopping some services to focus on the, peer, uh, to focus on the services that I've mentioned before. In terms of communication, a key strategic priority for us, actually we've now created a COVID-19 landing page on our website. So if you log on now to the, the North Tyneside Council's website, the top one has been removed and it's COVID-19 advice. It's a one-stop shop on what does that mean, some advice some, uh, following national guidance, but what impact on services, we will keep that updated. So if anybody wants to find out anything, direct them to the website. It may redirect you somewhere else, but that's where you'll find out the impact. And I hope you can all follow us on social media. There is regular updates going out there in terms of the impact on the council and, again, good advice for our community. And also, all members are being copied into our daily situation report. As this is the impact on the service today. These are the decisions that's been made. I must say, we're going to shift from daily to weekly from next week for that um, situation report. That's just on kind of like the capacity and kind of uh, uh, um, the demand on staff kind of producing that report. Um, I'm going to hand over to Bryn now, who's going to kind of um, touch on some issues that you may need to consider during this period. Thank you, Phil. So, obviously, from our perspective as, a, as administrators for yourselves, the first and perhaps most obvious impact will be that the elections which were scheduled for the 7th of May have been postponed until the 6th of May 2021. Uh, that also includes all by-elections, so any, by, any vacancies that occur in the forthcoming year or are existing at the moment will not be held until that same date of the 6th of May 2021. It's also very likely that face-to-face -face meetings will change within the Council. We already have a, a recommendation around to all officers that only business critical face-to-face -face meetings should happen and other, other meetings should look to be undertaken electronically, whether it be by phone or by video conferencing. Um, there is currently uh, a move from central government that uh, the requirement to hold an annual meeting will be suspended for this year. And similarly, other potential meetings may also be affected by a, a requirement not to hold public meetings. Um, equally, to, to back that up though, there is a push from central government that we look at uh, introducing electronic meetings for a period of time. So that would be either, again, by telephone or by video conferencing. Um, there are certain parts of very northern Scotland that do that already. So this is, this is technology that can be used. Um, on top of that, some functions of the authority will be delegated as and when necessary. So rather than uh, decisions having to be taken by cabinet or council, potentially they will be delegated to office, individual officers or individual cabinet members. I'm conscious that we've already had that start with a delegation through planning committee, delegating planning decisions to uh, Phil Scott in consultation with the, the chair and deputy chair of planning. Um, and for some functions that we undertake, and particularly some functions that will, will directly impact on members, we will be taking longer. Um, particularly if you think about things like members' inquiries, we will uh, suffer as we go on, potentially from a, a lack of staff. Um, we will do our best to keep pursuing them but there may come a point at which we have to pause because staff will be redeployed into other more critical areas. Um, if, for members' information, the local government and, and uh, adult healthcare ombudsman has already said that it is no longer accepting new complaints. And that may be an approach that we have to look at in due course in order to reduce workloads so that we can deploy staff as and when necessary. So, during the, the next uh, interrupted period, um, 
I suppose the first, the first and foremost role for members is you are our eyes and ears in the communities that you serve. Um, you are very well placed on the ground to identify any vulnerabilities amongst the population, listen to businesses, feed information in both directions. So information you receive from us can be disseminated to your constituents and vice versa, information coming from your constituents can be fed back to the council. Um, it is vitally important that you set the right example for your constituents, follow the government guidance, I know it's been said several times already, it is there for the purpose of suppressing the, the infection rate. We also need you to look after your own health, look after your own hygiene, and make sure that you and your loved ones are, are safe and looked after and following the guidance. Um, so I have to say tonight is a fantastic example that obviously members are sitting in such a way that we maintain a quorum, but we are maintaining a degree of social distancing and protecting particularly those members who are more vulnerable. Um, I suppose the final point as, as up there, business as usual is going to change over the next 6 to 12 months depending on how the infection goes and how council services are impacted by staff uh, absence rates. Um, please bear with us, we will continue to do as much as we can, but obviously as Phil has said, some prioritisation of services will have to be made and that, those decisions will be made in due course. I think finally I'm going to hand back over to Paul to let him conclude this evening. Okay, thanks, Brent. Um, I've managed to go completely the wrong way. There you go. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, we'll try and answer any questions you have. I think I would finish as I began. We, we are all used to, as members and officers, responding to the needs of the borough, businesses, visitors, residents. I don't think any of us have quite dealt with anything like this before. It is unusual and therefore testing us. Um, we don't right now have a team who are poorly, but I have a number of people that fall into the national gains. Um, categories around all of that so in terms of stress on services just to bring it to life some of that is very real Phil and his team are working hard to make sure we maintain the crews that do the refuse collections Jackie um, Old and her team have been looking hard at how we maintain the staffing around some of our residential children's um, settings um, where we've had to send some staff home. We spent some time this afternoon with our trade unions making sure they understood the approach we'll be taking to identifying stresses in the workforce against those priority tasks and then looking for volunteers from, our, um, from the organisation to think about where they can step in and help. Um, the, the libraries and sport and leisure team have been brilliant and are absolutely gagging to what difference can we make but we'll be making sure nobody does anything where they're not trained for it, they're not safe and they're not looking after themselves but we are already into a period where we are, we are stretched on some of those critical services and we're having to reorganise accordingly. I think the thing that, that we continue to look at and Phil gave a flavour of it as did Wendy, this is many months even with successful interventions and the way that the government's adopted a, a particular stance in the last few days, it will be um, many months. We spent quite a lot of time trying to get everybody to look after themselves and each other. That's particularly important for the North Tyneside gang in terms of looking after the borough. And the last bit is that community leadership will be important. I think from a personal point of view, I hadn't really got it till I went to Morrison's on Sunday. Um, and nearly all of North Shields, including our MP, was in Morrison's. Um, and, and you realise the degree of kind of social anxiety. Some of that is fuelled, as Wendy and Phil have intimated, by how the media have covered some of this and how social media is covering it. So that communication and leadership role is really important to all of us. Um, I don't want to lapse into keep calm and carry on cliches because this is really worrying for lots of people. But our job is to be calm and do the job in front of us. Um, so, I'm more than happy, backed up by an expert panel, <laughs> to try and answer any questions, but my last word before, before I shut up is how incredibly proud I am of the senior team that have stepped into this and the team that, that, that I lead. Um, this is really difficult and really uncertain. I think Wendy has done more TV and radio than she's previously done in her entire career. 
but important things like turning up at Long Benton High School and dealing with a set of really worried parents uh, makes a huge difference to their lives and how they feel. Working with our head teachers to help them understand what's going on. I'm just, uh, you know, it is. Um, it, it's a privilege to work alongside some brilliant public service professionals and the field support we've had from all elected members and the work we've tried to do in the last few weeks. If we can keep that going, we'll be right. Anyway, so I'll have a go at some questions, but mostly I'll look at Wendy. <laughs> Happy to take questions, Chair. Any questions, Councillor Wilson? Thank you. Uh, really, really helpful briefing. Uh, I came here with a question that's only been partially answered, and so I wondered if you could just fill in the gaps for me. Uh, I found the daily briefings really helpful. It hadn't escaped my attention that uh, the number of confirmed cases in North Tyneside uh, hadn't been updated on a daily basis, although the briefing was doing, you know, it's, it still sits there, um, as being the figure that was given on the 11th of March. So the partial answer is that. I heard earlier, I think it was from Wendy, that community testing stopped on the 12th of March uh, and that there's now a reliance on data being provided from the hospitals. Um, so I just wondered in terms of us expecting updates on the number of cases in the borough, uh, what's the plan there and how are we going to receive that information? The, the shift into a delay phase means that the information changes completely. So at the point at which we were reporting the individual cases we had, we were watching those around a containment question. We're now at a point where, as Wendy's explained, about 80% of the population will get this. And it becomes not irrelevant, but less important. It's understanding the general position. Um, the, there is a move nationally to increase testing. And there is, as you know, a national, an international debate about whether or not community testing makes a difference or not. Um, at the moment, that uh, testing rate is going to increase, but we're not absolutely going to start reporting those kind of, that's where we are in case terms now. The numbers haven't shifted dramatically in terms of confirmed cases, but it just, it becomes a different story, Councillor. So I don't know if Wendy wants to add anything, but in terms of where we are, that change of approach reflects the change of phase. Um, I think it's fair to say there's a, there's a serological test and prototype which should be ready, I, I guess, in the next two to three weeks, um, the Chief Medical Officer has confirmed, which will tell us who's had the infection, so that will pick up the antibodies for anybody who's been infected. And if we could get widespread testing of that, it would give us an idea of um, who's been infected thus far. Um, we're, we're still doing a bit of testing, so if there's outbreaks in, for example, residential and nursing homes, then Public Health England are doing some testing there. But um, I, we're not really sure what it means when uh, the Prime Minister says we're going to ramp up testing, um, particularly uh, beyond and above um, what they're doing currently. So I, I guess we're just waiting to, to hear what that looks like. I think I would, the other thing I would add is our local intelligence from our two acute trusts tells us that there's not great numbers actually in hospital currently, which is really reassuring. Um, I think the biggest challenge for the two acute um, hospital trusts is around the capacity um, and, and staffing uh, because of the social distancing um, guidelines, which clearly makes it a bit tricky. So that's one of the things that I know both um, organisations are grappling with at the minute. Are you Councillor Moore? I just wanted to um, ask you about um, being the eyes and the ears of the local community. If, if a family with children or if older people have an issue that's connected with the COVID virus, who do we do we do it through member services or is there another way you want us to communicate that problem? So the 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 if uh, what I can do, it might help members, is if I just explain our approach to vulnerable people full stop and the work we're doing now to in order, enable you to do that. There are three ways through, through that we're coming at this. Nationally, the strategic direction we've been given as a local authority is to maintain current social care for vulnerable people we are already supporting. So making sure that we look after the adults and children we already look after. 
um, knowing that that staff and team come under some pressure and that the providers in the market are under some pressure. But doing that in addition to handling additional discharges from hospital. So in some ways, that's really difficult, but Jackie would, would kill me for saying this, it's a bit more straightforward because we have capability processes and we understand how to look after adults and children who come into social care. The other two things that we're trying to do are how do we identify vulnerable people in the borough and how do we support them. So some work is going on nationally to specifically identify those in the highest risk groups using NHS data and feeding that out to local authorities and getting in touch with those individuals directly. But we know that the vulnerabilities in the community will be much greater than that, the kind of family you were just explaining. So we're doing two things at the moment. One of them is we have a lot of data about the borough. The information commissioner has relaxed some guidance around using data sets. And right now, some of Jackie Lawton's team and Craig are busy crunching all the intelligence we've got to work out who do we know we should worry about and, and where are they broadly in the borough, in some cases where they live. So we are going through an exercise in the next few days around identifying people and starting to think about where we might need to concentrate our effort. The third bit, which speaks to your question, councillor, is what do we do when people come towards us? So we are trying to think about this in terms of online, on the phone, and in person. And while we wouldn't necessarily encourage people to come and see us, we know people will turn up at our customer first centres in particular. So in the middle of North Shields, Walls End, Killingworth and, and Whitley Bay Fort will turn up. That's be, that was being worked through by the team anyway in terms of being able to tell you how, how to send somebody to us. But what's also happening is there is a requirement being asked of local government to put together those community hubs, Phil alluded to them, to build um, a bit of a bridge between the local authority and the uh, community, working with a trusted partner, in our case that's Voda, to start to build a bit of a network around each one of those centres, thinking about how can we um, make sure we've got people out and about in the community that can you know, provide some, it might be, you know, we're looking at the offer now, it might be around food, it might be about cash, it might be about jobs, um, you know, little jobs getting done, it might be about just some social contact. What offer can we make? And we're trying to get to a point where we reshape our website so that people can contact us and get information. We repurpose the two contact centres we have, both for housing repairs and for our general inquiries. We're thinking about that now, and we'll, base the, we'll probably start to base some teams and capability out of each of our customer first centres. As soon as we work that out, Jackie Lawton's got a lot of flip charts and there's some national guidance come from the Secretary of State. We'll share that with all members so you know where to send them. Councillor Kerwin. Thank you for that uh, presentation, it was very interesting um, and useful. Um, hopefully my question is really simple. Simple. <laughs> um, do our staff, and I'm thinking of teams like the Reglement team, do our staff have the personal protective equipment that they need to do their jobs? And are we working with our commission services, such as nursing homes, residential homes, home care, to ensure that their staff have the personal protective equipment so they can continue to provide the services to the vulnerable people of North Tyneside? So right now, with relatively low levels of infection, we've done a massive risk assessment around everybody who goes anywhere near a human being or goes into a house. In terms of additional PPE, over the next week or so, the government has worked with each of the local resilience forums to deliver something like 25,000 packages of PPE to uh, personal protective equipment to all of healthcare sites, social care providers and local authorities. So that effort is happening now. Obviously, we're working with our teams around making sure they stay safe right now. But as the, as the infection rate rises, at the moment, I've got nothing that says I won't have the right equipment for our teams. And we're doing a lot to think about how do we keep them safe, working with both our trade unions and businesses in the borough that are in contact with, with people who might carry a risk right now. The, the important thing that, that Wendy was talking about in terms of what our foundation trusts are reporting is that we think we're about four weeks behind London, who's at the front of the kind of uh, UK curve on this. So we're not complacent about that, but we've had confirmation today that that kit's on the way. Councillor Graham. Thanks, Councillor. 
thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Wendy, Phil and Paul and all the SLT and all the staff um, for working to keep North Tyneside safe and, and doing your very best. I'm sure you're all grafting really, really hard and putting loads of hours in. Um, but what I want to ask is, um, is there any way that you can apply pressure through to government um, to do with things like um, what was announced yesterday on education? Um, the government needs to trust us more. We know our communities really, really well. And announcing something like schools are closing without a list of key workers, no exams without any backup about what's going to happen to those kids who are not taking their exams and then what's going to happen about their university place is really irresponsible and we need to get that message back to government and are you doing that? I'm not sure that the, 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 the politician, you know, the elected members and, and MPs will take their own view on this. I'm not sure I'd describe it as irresponsible. Um, I, what I'm experiencing is a, a, a serious number of um, senior national politicians wrestling with something that is not something that's within their easy reach. The, um, the, the, and, and when it comes to the decision around schools, I have a great deal of sympathy for the government on that because I have been at the short end, as has Wendy, of our own schools and how they're feeling about this. So if I know, I know, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of our 78 head teachers and the, their teams, everybody that works in our schools, and the difference they make in the borough. But they've had a tough week. Um, they've had staff, you know, it's been different. We've had some brilliant responses. You know, I've had a number of head teachers say, "We've got a big building. I've got everybody DBS checked. Um, what can we do to help?" Um, if schools are closed, the decisions taken um, in, in in Wales and Scotland. We're a bit quick out the blocks in terms of where we were nationally and where the science was, but I do understand the pressures on the workforce. So I could feel locally and, and got into a couple of interesting debates with head teachers. Um, I could feel locally how that was for me um, in terms of their decision taking. I, I, I can imagine what it must feel like sized up. Um, the, the, the question around key workers was always going to be really, really tricky. That's a live debate. We're expecting that to settle in the next few hours. Um, local government associations' position is that local authorities have to be part of that equation. If local government is going to deliver the response that's been requested, then local government staff need their kids at school so they can get on with the job. Um, but we've got to do that in a way that keeps the kids safe and keeps um, school teachers safe. Um, there's a bit of a debate about the exams are, are, are an interesting one. Um, if I was speculating, I wonder what it might change in terms of national policy around how we test and how we examine. I was interested to see our, um, uh, our um, medical schools essentially check assessment and pass test data to get this year's cadres of doctors and nurses into the NHS quickly. Um, so there is a direct conversation, as I started the presentation, between the local government association, nine representative chief executives, solace and ministers about what works and what not works, what doesn't work. Uh, what I can say is we're being listened to and the questions we're asking are being answered. Um, it's a really tough one for everyone involved um, and we're all going to kind of need a bit of patience with each other. Um, but, you know, as I said to my team earlier in the week, as a dad, I've been asked the school question every day. Um, so it was a tricky one. We think it'll settle. Diane, Buckle and Jackie have been, work been working with our head teachers today to think about, well, what would we do anyway? We were already worried about young people who are in receipt of free school meals. We have a real debate about um, children with additional needs, and particularly our special schools. Um, and some of those young people are safer and healthier in a school setting because they're supported and some are better at home. And we have to make individual decisions for those young people. Councillor Stirling. Yeah, um, it's basically, I, I know North Tyneside always does the best that they can in this and that, that and the other. But I have a, I have a worry about uh, the testing. To be honest, the amount of testing we've done in this country tells me nothing. To be honest, it's only testing people who've actually took very ill with it and went to hospitals. But 
from what I'm hearing on the television, some people hardly have any symptoms at all. So basically, we don't know how this virus works, you know, and I was always to know your enemy. And basically, we're not finding out very much about it by the amount of testing we're doing. Because first of all, you have to know the mortality rate in different age groups. You know, some people will be getting very few symptoms and not get tested. And then, so we don't know that. We're never going to get that. <clears throat> Do you not think we've taken too long about starting to get into this virus and actually getting the testing done that should be done? This third world country is doing more testing than us. And it really worries me that we're just sort of sailing along there. Oh, well, we're going to lose maybe so many people. I'd want to know with the mortality rate in certain age groups of this. And the only way we can do that is by doing a lot more testing. Because there's people out there who had this virus and never knew they had it. So I really think we've actually missed, missed a step on this one. We should have actually started with testing a lot earlier and done a lot more of it. So I understand and respect your opinion, and I could probably get you on a Skype conversation with one of Wendy's team that could talk at length about what that actually means in terms of where we are in mortality rates. There's a couple of things I would say in knowing your enemy, as Wendy indicated at the beginning of the, um, at the, beginning of the presentation, coronaviruses have been around for a good 30 years. We're not doing very well against them nationally. Uh, internationally, globally, people have spent a lot of time wrestling with a number of things, including the common cold. The science around this, as I said, hasn't settled because it's a new and involve, evolving virus and a whole set of internationally renowned folk having a bit of a debate about what the numbers tell them. The big issue we've got when it comes to things like the mortality rate is exactly as you said, Councillor. We, we, um, we know the numerator in some cases, but we don't know the denominator. We don't know how many people have had this and we therefore can't predict one number into another. The whole shift towards a delay phase is absolutely based on trying to reduce the, the mortality rate from the infection. The whole point of the exercise and the, the diagram Wendy and Phil have been using is an attempt to shift how this disease moves through the UK population in order to try and keep it within NHS critical care capacity because that's what will keep people alive. Haven't we known this has been coming for years and years and there hasn't been enough planning actually. We've known with the SARS virus and stuff like that that there was something big going to come along the line and basically it looks as if we've possibly got it this time. But there's been, you know, if you know something's coming you should actually have your, all your stuff ready there to test and stuff like that and basically we, have, we haven't been doing enough. I, I, I'm not sure whether or not I could quantify the global research effort on this and say whether or not it's enough. enough. I think two things are true. One is that we absolutely knew that pandemic flu was a global health risk. I think it's also true that how it chooses to manifest as a virus in its particular form is something that nobody could have absolutely known and there's a global effort mobilised to try and deal with it. Councillor Steve Cox. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just think I'd like to start by saying that I found the presentation very, very helpful and very clear. It was nice to see the information coming to a North Tyneside level and seeing how the, how the team and the officers around the Council are looking at a, a wide range of issues and are, are trying the best you can to look ahead and how we're going to deal with things in the future. Um, but the, the key point I'd like to make is sort of nationally, from the very highest level, and it isn't meant as a, a direct criticism or anything, some of the messages have been a bit unclear, and by the time they've got into the media, and certainly by the time they've got on the social media, they've ended up as something very, very confusing. So I would just like to highlight the, the point of talking about having a banner on our website, talking about our issues in our communities, and encouraging people to use that. Because I think if we're, if we're getting, it's important we get the right advice because I still have some concerns that I'm not sure whether everybody's getting this message as to how serious this is potentially going to become. And I think we need to highlight that and make sure people are getting the right advice on a local level. So I'd just like to highlight that. Thanks. So I, 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 I understand the, the confusion. I think what I was saying earlier around how the media have handled this and how social media has re recorded it. The, the, the information we're using is what Public Health England are coming up with. 
a bit, a bit of the issue around that, and you're all politicians, and you've all dealt with having to get a message over, and then what the world does with it is something different. The information we're providing locally is the information that we're using nationally. The, 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 the issue for the community is the absolute saturated news coverage and the, the depth and breadth of social media around all of this. So we will just absolutely keep trying to make sure that the messages that are coming out nationally are what we use locally. And we can use some different messages and people trust us in different ways, but um, what we are using is what's coming out nationally. It's the fact that it then goes into a 24 hour rolling news cycle or into social media land is, is what's causing a lot of that confusion. There are also maybe one or two things that are really, really complicated and they're very, very hard to render into very straightforward messages. One of the things I've admired Wendy for is her ability to talk to a range of audiences and explain things in a pretty straightforward manner. One follow up there. That, that's what I found about the presentation. I thought it was very clear, and I, I think I think it was Phil said that it was going to, it was going to be circulated to yes. members. And uh, it was I, I found that good. Was Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Bartoli. Thank you. I just wondered whether you had any, any information on the availability of small business grants or funding, short term emergency funding for small businesses, and whether anything had been announced yet. Yes. Um, so, uh, one, of our, one of the priorities that's up there is around um, payment, um, the whole revenues and benefits service and keeping that going because the national attitude towards this is to use existing mechanisms. So it's really important to us that we make sure that both for individuals and for businesses that we are ready to staff that up. So, in combination between the budget and the um, the, the Chancellor's recent announcements, the first thing that we know we will have to do is um, a rebilling for um, every business that is under £51,000 rateable value. They've had a bill for business rates for next year. We will be rebilling and setting that to zero and will be refunded by government. So they will have their um, business rates paid um, from public purse. Um, there will be, in addition to that, um, small business grant funding um, that was originally around about uh, £3,000 but has been settled at around £10,000 at the moment. Um, we think there's about 2,418 businesses that will qualify for that in North Tyneside. We have about 5,000 businesses. Um, so we're awaiting news of when that will be paid. We're looking like the actual cash will turn up in the beginning of April. We will pay that through the business rate system. There's also a set of expanded retail discounts to um, the um, retail, leisure and hospitality sectors. So the, the public purse will pick up the, um, the rates around um, those businesses in an attempt to give them some support at a difficult time. And then finally, there's a further grant relief funding pot, which we think is heading for the retail, hospitality and leisure. Um, businesses that are towards the smaller end of the scale uh, we think we've got about 349 of those and again we'll pay those through um, our existing business rate um, arrangements the um, the secretary of state for education has also announced there'll be a business rate payment holiday for um, nursery providers uh, non-state nursery providers um, and we're looking at the detail of that now the way they're going to do it is they will use the national non-domestic rating returns and evaluation office data. We'll fill in the kind of form we normally fill in at the end of the year, or an NDR1, as some of you know and love it. Um, that'll, fit, that'll identify the businesses. We get cash based on the value of that, and we'll then pay that straight out to um, um, our businesses, probably in early April, is what we're being told. So Andy Scott, who many of you know and love, has spent a lot, the last few days with a towel wrapped around his head, making sure that we're ready as a team to translate that cash into grants to business. Of course. So just in, in terms of small business funding or, or um, grants, yes, there'll be nothing immediately available in the short term to see businesses over a, what's going to be a difficult period. Be early, early April, which is two and a half, three weeks away. And I realise that's a long time if you're running a business, but we are not billing them for business rates that would have been due on the 10th of April, and we're, we're looking to make grant payments to those businesses in early April when we get the cash from government. 
and they'll automatically be paid rather than applied for? We are expecting to pay them automatically based on the, um, the valuation of the property and the size of the business. But that one, that one's, uh, you know, the big, the big figures are just being disaggregated. We are all just identifying. I can do numbers because Andy's worked out whose hours are. We do a return and the cash comes back. We will pay that as quickly as we possibly can. It will be made as a Section 31 grant in the local authority. We'll do it as quickly as we possibly can. But it won't be an application process. It will be, um, it will be distributed through the grant system. The other one that members haven't asked me about is the hardship fund, how that works for individuals. Uh, currently announced that 500 million potentially going to be expanded. We've been asked to think about that in the context of the local council tax support scheme. So can we pay it back through council tax? Um, who would we prioritise and how would that work? And that's part of the answer to micro businesses where people aren't in a property, um, self-employment where um, they may be registered for tax but not rates. So we have to think about how that would work, and there, in, there is no, the, the, there's kind of emergent thinking, but there's no guidance on any of those yet. But we will do it as quickly as we can once we know what we're doing and we've got the cash. Members will understand these sums are not small, they're many millions of pounds, and in cash flow terms it's not something we just have. So the, the Treasury is gearing up to pay that as a Section 31 grant. Councillor Early. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> um, it's not really a question, it's just um, because it may be some time before we meet again in this forum. Um, I know it's very early days, but I would just like to publicly record my thanks to you and your team and all our uh, members of staff across the council for the extraordinary levels of professionalism and commitment that they've shown to date, and I know they'll go on showing. I spoke to an officer yesterday who uh, has had to self-isolate but is working from home. Um, says for the past week she's regularly been starting work at six o'clock in the morning, finishing around six o'clock in the evening. Um, and I think that's probably uh, symptomatic of the level of work and commitment and professionalism that you and your staff have shown. And I uh, know that you're making the best efforts that you can to keep the people of North Tyneside safe. I'd just like to, to thank you all for, for everything you've done so far and will continue to do. Thank you, Councillor. I think that's reflected from all of us. I mean, I'll be able to be recorded in a minute. Councillor Brady, did you indicate you wanted to speak? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to echo the sentiments, really, about the clarity of the presentation this evening and, and what that means for the amount of work, again, that has been put in by the senior team and all of the members of the Council. I think we've as members, we're greatly reassured by that, and I think it stands very uh, strongly in terms of the um, resilience and robustness of North Tyneside Council. Uh, the matter I want to raise is a bit of a delicate one, which is in relation to number of deaths and how much that might put stress on bereavement services. Do you anticipate that will happen, and also how we communicate that to people? The, um, the, I, 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 I'm sure you've read papers and watched the media, the death management industry isn't something that people hear as a phrase very often because those of us who are in it don't talk about it very much. Um, but I was interested to notice that the national press is using that language. The bereavement services we run, um, I, 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 you know, we, as part of our emergency planning, councillor, we have to think through um, things like mass fatalities. So Philip and I have spent quite a lot of time and probably more hours than we hoped over our lives thinking about things like crematoria, operating hours, capacity, um, and how we handle a mass fatality incident. We have to work with Bryn and the coronial service, the coroner's office, around how we handle temporary mortuaries, how we do body storage, and how we do that with sympathy and dignity. So I think all I'd want to say, particularly in a public forum, is that we've always had to think about this. We've looked at the national modelling and we've looked at our capacity and capability and we know as a borough we can deal with what might be coming towards us. The other thing I would say is that we need to prepare and support our team around that. They're always very professional, but it's a difficult job and we need to think about how we look after the team. And then finally, um, while the, um, 
the, 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 the Registrar's National Forum have issued guidance on weddings, which is helpful and must be really upsetting for people who have big weddings planned. And I know Phil's had to take his hat back for Princess Beatrice's wedding. Um, the, um, the, we're waiting for national guidance on funeral gatherings. With the team have done a great job of being very sensitive about that <coughs> and not disrupting um, planned family celebrations and commemorations. But we are going to have to look at how we do that differently. There's legislation being put in place for how, um, uh, how death is handled, what medical requirements are in place, what we can do to direct the trade to work with funeral directors in different ways, who can transport bodies and when um, uh, and how services take place. But as a borough, Phil and I with Sam and Andrea have satisfied ourselves. We've got capacity to deal with the issues we have before us. Councillor Bartoli, I'll let you in quickly because I'm conscious of time. We're going to move on. Any any more questions anybody's got with the director and the officers directly via email? I think it's just a quick one. Have you got any advice on uh, whole continuing our ward surgeries, uh, or is it just a personal uh, personal issue? I, I, I mean, we, we issued some advice last week, um, which which was overtaken by events in moments. I would be very, very careful about um, your surgeries right now in terms of social distancing. Um, I, I, and I watch all 61 of you get easily and quickly contacted by anybody who wants to get at you by phone or by email. Um, I think right now we'd be suggesting you were really careful about ward surgeries. Um, anything that encourages a gathering, it would be possible, but I, would, I, I don't think any of us would say that that's a good thing to do, um, because you, you, all 61 of you are really important to us, and we'd like you to stay safe. Thank you, just a, a quick one for me, come the slide, please say it to the members who are not here, please. Absolutely, we'll make sure it's available to all councillors and the mayor. Yeah, just a bit of clarity for uh, probably point that Wendy on about the uh, on about ibuprofen earlier there's been a little bit of confusion because there's a lot of stuff going about in, on social media about um, is, does that is that directed at all uh, steroid, non steroid uh, anti inflammatories or just ibuprofen no, I, th I think the message is really clear if if you're on other um, steroidal um, medication anti inflammatory medication for other things then you should continue to take um, those those medications you shouldn't stop clearly you know people are, are, are prescribed a whole range of other um steroidal um and the inflammatory drugs for other reasons so no you keep going with those thank you very much thank you very much to all the thank officers you. thanks for your time i really appreciate it and your support <laughs>